Amen. I don't know about you, but I love hearing stories of redemption. I love hearing stories of restoration. And uh, I love hearing those stories because it's stories of how God moves in our midst. Amen? And so it's just wonderful to be able to watch uh, God move in, in people's life and, and just know that he is restoring lives and, and just, just really just taking people to a place they've never been before. It's just real exciting to me to know that God is working those kinds of miracles, and he's still in the, in the business of restoration, and, and, um, and I love John and Jan's testimony. I love uh, how God is, uh, has just really radi radically changed them and is using them, uh, even in one of our ministries called Celebrate Recovery here at Cross Point. And so it's just wonderful to see those stories, and, uh, and, and not just their story, but so many other stories. It, it's really cool this past week um, on Thursday night, I got a text from a mother here in our church, and and uh, she was texting me to let me know that her five-year-old uh, son had just given his life to the Lord. And so, amen. Thank you, Miss June, for celebrating that. And, uh, but it, it's wonderful. You know, uh, we, we just went through a series um, called Who's Your One? And it's, uh, it's a year-long church-wide uh, initiative, spiritual initiative, to say to, to Jesus and say to each other that we we care about people knowing the Lord. We want people to know Jesus, and we, we know that Jesus is a better way, and so we launched a series called Who's Your One, and I know uh, for one excited mom, she's very excited about her son giving his life to Christ as he uh, was one of hers that she was praying for this year to come to know Jesus, and I thought it was uh, really remarkable because a few days later, because of uh, that initiative, Who's Your One, she had shared with her son also about the need to share her, his faith, his new faith now, in Jesus with other people his age. And, and a few days later, she texted me. She said, during bath time, he was sharing with his little brother about Jesus. And, uh, and, and so it's just amazing to see how God is working in our midst. All you have to do is look around. All you have to look, do is look around. You know, we live in a world today where there's a lot of bad news. There's a lot of bad things happening and a lot of things to discourage you. Uh, I've just about quit watching the news because I can't stand it anymore. And uh, it's, just so, um, it's just so raw and just, uh, you know, just divisive, it seems like. But uh, if you open your eyes and talk to people who know Jesus and who are, uh, are following him, you will begin to see that God is still moving. He's still bringing people to know him, and he is still restoring lives. Amen. Can we just celebrate Jesus together this morning? I tell you, I love it. I love it. I love how God is moving. Uh, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 26 this morning. Matthew chapter 26. We're going toward the end of Matthew's gospel here, and we're going to be looking into a passage here starting with verse 69 that is a fairly lengthy passage, and we're going to look at some really remarkable things. But this morning, we're looking at another story as we follow along in Peter's life. You know, the, uh, Peter is one that we've been We've been walking with, uh, sort of uh, partnering with him on his journey with Jesus, and we started with him coming to know Christ as his Lord and Savior, and, and then we begin to realize that Peter's learning a lot just walking with Christ, and, and I hope as well as we look at these stories that you begin to, to learn a lot of, as well about how uh, God interacts with people and how God is interacting with you in your life. I know that one of the things I, I love about reading Scripture is how as I read through scripture, I begin to sort of see myself in that situation. And I begin to realize that God's word applies very, uh, very uh, intentionally toward my own life. And I realize that the lessons that people like Peter learned from Jesus, those same lessons are lessons that, uh, that I'm learning as well. And so that's the purpose in just sort of walking with Peter uh, as, as he journeys with Jesus. And, and, and you know, we've, we've talked about that Peter's life, uh, it was not perfect. In fact, his love for Jesus wasn't perfect, but it was real and it was authentic. And, G, you know, Peter loved Jesus a lot and, and he made mistakes. He pushed through them. He learned from them. Uh, but what we're going to see today is, is yet another situation where where Peter is learning some valuable lessons about his uh, Savior, about his faith in Christ. And, and he, he's, he's taken a lot away from the experiences that he experienced in walking with Jesus. Today is not so much a lesson learned as it was just something that Peter experienced along the way. 
And I think a lot of times in our experiences, we learn a lot from those. We, we go through good times, we go through bad times, and it's in those moments that we take away a lot of the lessons that Jesus wants to learn. So this isn't necessarily Jesus just teaching Peter something, but this is a circumstance in which Peter uh, learned from that circumstance. And, and we certainly know that we can learn from that. Now this, this text that we're that we're about to read, it's, it's a passage that follows Jesus uh, making very much aware to his disciples that he is getting ready to go to the cross. This is not the news they want to hear. This isn't, you know, he's sort of laying the groundwork uh, for going to the cross, and he's talking about his death. And so th this is something that the disciples are going to find to be very uncomfortable. But, uh, but again, we see some really remarkable things that... Uh, that, that Peter experiences in this story that we're gonna be looking at today. And, and so the story or the issue that Peter has to deal with is the bitter pain of regret. The bitter pain of regret. We're gonna be looking at Matthew 26, starting with verse 69. You know, if, if I were to ask you, if I were to ask for a show of hands this morning, how many of you ever done something or said something that you regretted, uh, no doubt it would be unanimous and that we all have experiences that we, as we look back on our life, we just say, man, I wish that hadn't happened in my life or I wish I hadn't said that in my life. I know that uh, many times uh, in the heat of arguments or, or situations in our life, we may use words that we can never take back. And those words, oftentimes, as we think about those conversations that we had where we may have hurt someone or someone may have hurt us, we realize that we are living a life uh, of regret, oftentimes looking back at those past circumstances. And so I, I love what God's word teaches us about regret because it helps us to overcome regret. And I, I have no doubt that this morning as we dive into God's word together and as we look at this lesson that these are gonna be life truths that are gonna help us uh, to overcome the pain of regret. And that's what's gonna happen to Peter as we see this. He's gonna find himself in a position where there's a lot of regret in his life, and we're gonna see how uh, Jesus handled that situation and, and obviously learned from it. So with that being said, I wanna invite you to stand with me here this morning. Uh, this is our way of just continuing to honor God through the reading of his word. We stand to, to lift up our voices, we stand to pray, and we stand to read God's word together as we prepare to hear from him this morning through the reading and preaching of his word. And so Matthew 26, starting with verse 69, it says this. It says, now Peter was sitting outside in the, in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. And he went out to the entrance. Another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. He says, I do not know the man. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself, and he began to swear, and he says, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. I want you to look at Peter's response here. He says, and he went out and he wept bitterly. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you, God, for your presence in our life. And Lord, as we, as we come together for the reading and the preaching of your word, I pray, Father, that you would, Lord, just open our hearts and our minds, that we would be receptive to your voice this morning as you speak deeply into who we are as people God, knowing and trusting that, God, you care for us and that you love us unconditionally. And so, Father, we are thankful for that. We're thankful for your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness in our life. And, God, when we find ourselves in situations that we regret, God, we also know that comfort can be found in a true and authentic relationship with you. And so, Father, we just, we turn to you today. Because, God, we know that there are some of us in this room today that are living a life where we can't seem to get over the circumstances in our life. There, there oftentimes seems to be so much regret in our life. But God, we know that you're the answer. We know that you're a better way. And so Father, we just praise you and thank you and ask that you be with us now. 
as we continue to walk through your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated here this morning. Now, I've already mentioned here that all of us, everyone, experiences shame and regret at some point in our life. Sometimes that regret is over our words. There's often been things that, that I would say, even to my wife, that later I wish I could take back, and there's just no way. I mean, in the heat of an argument or the heat of a moment, you, you just say things that are hurtful, and when you say those things, you find yourself just later just reeling from that and wishing you could go back and take it back and, and knowing that, that the things that you have said were, were so harmful that there's going to be a, a need for some time to restore that relationship. And so oftentimes we have these situations in our life where, where regret is just something that seems overwhelming to us because of the things that we say. Oftentimes regret comes from the things that we do, the things that we that we have done in our past. We, we think about the things that, that we have accomplished in our life. And, and sometimes as we go through life, as we try to move forward, we can't help but keep looking back at the past and wondering how we're ever gonna overcome the despair and the sorrow and the pain of regret that seems to be following us wherever we go. And so oftentimes the regret can come from a, a place of, uh, of the things that we have done, the things that we have said, but also, and this is the one I really want to sort of focus on here today, also regret can come from a place of sin, where for whatever reason in our life, we find ourselves pursuing the unrighteous over the righteous. For whatever reason, we, we, we seem to be comfortable with sin, and we seem to be okay with sin, and we, we pursue those things rather than the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to grant us permission to sin. And so as we, as we find ourselves going through life, we find ourselves, if we're not careful, embracing sin in our life, which leads to a, a really a path of destruction and pain. And when we, when we find ourselves doing that, we, we often uh, just find ourselves just sort of dragging this regret, this thing called regret, along with us. And so that's where a lot of the regret in our life, it seems to come from, from these words, from our actions, the things that we do, and even from the sin in our life. And, and regret, if we were to try to identify what regret was, it would be, in its basic sense, uh, sorrow and remorse over something that we have said or done. And so that's sort of the, the basic thing. I think it's also interesting that sometimes regret can be a part of our life, even over the things we haven't done. And what I mean by that is, is just as we look back over our life, we just seem to see nothing but a wasted life rather than something that was productive, especially as it relates to Jesus. I know when I was first called into ministry, I was so excited about the calling that God had placed on my life. I was so excited about this new journey and this new this newfound thing that God had placed in my life. I remember Linnell and I praying through it and just, just being excited. But then one of the things that sort of came over me as I thought about this was I started thinking, well, what about the last 14 years of my life where I wasn't living for Jesus, where I wasn't living out my calling? And I remember a hard thing to overcome was just regretting the last 14 years without recognizing that in those 14 years, God was developing me and growing me and equipping me for the task in which he had called. But it still was a very real thing to me. There was still a lot of regret in my life as I look back over my past. And it seemed as though it was just this sort of ball and chain that was attached to my, to my ankle as I went through life. I was constantly having to drag my past along with me. And I, I, I suppose here this morning that there are many of you that are probably struggling in that place as well. Many of you who are, who are living, thinking about all the things in your past that, that just, uh, you know, uh, you can't seem to get your mind off of. And in that, you find yourself very sorrowful over those things in your life and re very much living in a place of regret. So that's what we want to look at here this morning you know, as we dive into this text. Now, there's a lot that we can learn here as we look at this. And one of the things I think that we see here, one of the first things we see is as we start to read through this passage is we see where, where Peter, he just sort of disavows Jesus. It's in this moment that he is fearing for his life. Uh, if, you, if you remember, you know, Jesus has, has been arrested and, and uh, he's no doubt gonna be going to the cross very soon. 
And now the, uh, the crowd and the, the authorities, they're also looking to sort of eliminate anyone who was followers of Jesus. And it starts off with a, with a servant girl who points out that, that Peter was one of the ones who was a follower of Jesus. He was one who proudly walked with Jesus. He was one who proudly even defended Jesus throughout Jesus' ministry. He was a guy who was, who was very bold in his faith. And, and, and yet, as she called him out, as she pointed him out to the authorities, as she uh, unveiled this truth that he was a true follower of Christ, we see one of the most devastating moments in Peter's life where he says, I don't know Jesus. I don't know him. That's, you got the wrong guy. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a follower of Christ Jesus. That you, you, you're thinking of someone else. And so we see this begin to unfold in Peter's life. And, and as it unfolds once, it, it eventually it happens again. The, uh, another uh, person, another person who witnessed that, that this man was someone who walked with Jesus points him out again. And, and in this moment, we see the same thing begin to unfold as he denies Jesus. He says, oh, I, I'm sorry, but you got the wrong guy. And then it comes to a point where when the crowds come to him and they begin to, to truly just drill down on this, I mean, they've seen him. They know he's one of the, of the followers of Christ Jesus. And he begins to swear and, and, and curse himself. I mean, he's at a place of, of true desperation. Now, I want you to know as we look at this story that I don't believe for one moment that Peter didn't love Jesus. I don't believe for one moment that suddenly he had lost his faith. I think that fear was overcoming his life. This was a situation where the disciples were scattered about. They were running for their life. I mean, this was a, a situation that they never expected to happen in their life. They were seeing Jesus as someone who was going to reign here on this earth as well as the kingdom of heaven. And so the, the, these disciples Disciples were very confused about what was happening in their life. But in the heat of the moment, you have one of Jesus' disciples, one that was very close to, to Christ himself, suddenly, because of fear in his life, turning and denying Jesus in this moment. And so we see all this taking place. We see where Peter says not once and not twice, but three times that he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. To understand the context of this passage, to understand really the significance of what this passage is revealing to us, we would have to go back a few verses. And I want to read these to you this morning because I think they're they're, they're powerful enough and profound enough for us to understand what's taking place. And in verse 31, it says this, of the same chapter, Matthew 26, it says, then Jesus said to them, he's speaking to his disciples, and he says, you will all fall away because of me this night. He says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And so it's important to understand that Jesus is saying there'll come a time where they're gonna strike me down. There's come a time where they're gonna, they're gonna do away with me. And in that, the, the sheep, you disciples, are, you, you'll be scattered everywhere. And so Jesus already understands that this is a reality of what's gonna be taking place. Uh, he actually quotes Zer, uh, Z, uh, Zechariah uh, 13.7 as he, as he says this, and Zechariah. And, uh, and then in verse 32, he says this. He says, but after... I am raised up, speaking of his resurrection, he says, after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now look at Peter's response here, verse 33. And Peter answered him, he says, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. I don't think Peter's lying. I think he truly believes that he has the strength it takes to stick with Jesus all the way, to see this thing through. He says, others may fall away, but I'll never fall away. I'll never, I'll, I'll never give up on you. And then Jesus says to him in verse 34, he says, truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you. You see that? Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you you and all of the disciples said the same thing you know I think as believers and followers of Christ Jesus we probably all hope that we would be able to stand firm in our faith 
when we are confronted with death, amen? I think that's our hope. I think that's our, our desire. I think we would, we would love to know and be able to stand uh, just with such faith and boldness and confidence when our life is threatened over this thing called Christianity, over the, the, the one that we have a great love and, and admiration and even worship for, Jesus Christ, our Savior, that when a moment would be presented to us to where our faith is challenged and we have to stand firmly on Christ Jesus or so deny him, turn away from him and, and say, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm not a Christian. I was just sort of playing church. You know, I, I, that's not really who I am. Uh, they're, 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 you know, I think it, we would all like to think that if as believers and followers of Christ that our faith would be strong enough to stand firmly and to even say, Jesus, if necessary, I would die for you. That's exactly what Peter's doing here. Peter says, I will never deny you. I will never walk away from you. What Peter says is, even if I have to die, I'm there with you. And I believe with all great intentions, he meant that. But he let Jesus down. He let him down not once, not twice, but three times. He let him down by saying, I don't even know him. And it's in this moment that something was going to happen in Peter's life. It was in this moment, right after a rooster would crow, when, when, when Jesus had already said to him, before the rooster crows, three times you will deny me. Three times you will, you will say to those who are asking you, you don't even know me. He says, this will be the reality of your world, Peter. And upon hearing that crow, crow, suddenly Peter realized the truth in Jesus' statement. I don't think he intended to let Jesus down. But his faith wasn't as strong as he thought it was. And so we have this situation begin to unfold. And you know, I look at this and I think, man... I don't know, I find myself almost rooting for Peter. I almost find myself, like, man, come on, just pull yourself together. You know, stand firmly for Jesus. And, and I look at this and I think, man, what if it was me? What if it was me in that same situation? What if it was us in that same situation? How would it all play out? And then I got to thinking, you know, here in America, we don't have the to fear persecution by death. That's not a reality in our country, at least not today. It might be in some other countries of the world, but it's not here. We can go out into the streets and we can boldly proclaim the name of Jesus without any fear uh, of the government putting us to death. We, we can go out and we can be who we want to be and in Christ Jesus, our identity can lie you know, desperately in him, and we're okay with that. We can maybe get mocked a time or two for knowing Jesus or following Jesus, but we, we know that we love him, and we know that our life is not dependent upon it. But here's what I got to thinking. Maybe for us, it's not our life because of the absence of persecution to death. Maybe it's more our way of life or our lifestyle that's at risk in knowing Jesus. You know, we live in a world today where Christianity is, is honestly weak, where people think they're following Jesus and really they're not. People think they're following Jesus and they're living for themselves. And I just wonder when someone is confronted with a, a, a lifestyle or a way of life being changed, if you must stand on the word of God or stand on Christ Jesus and your faith in him. In other words, if, if unrighteousness is at the front door and, and the, the, the opportunity is given to us to either pursue a life of righteousness with Christ, in other words, to stand up for him and the faith that we have in him, or surrender to the flesh, surrender to our own desires and follow a much unrighteous path, which way we will choose. Because I think it's really 
the same thing. And I believe that each and every day there are people who call themselves Christians who may not be confronted with death, but where the word of God says, if you follow me, you will keep my commandments. If you love, Jesus even said this. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And yet, so often as we read through the truth of God's word, we find ourselves saying, you know what? That's just not for me, Jesus. And here's the problem that exists in today's Christianity. Many Christians don't mourn over their sin. There are too many Christians who don't mourn over their sin. What we see in this passage is a man who when he heard the rooster cry and he realized in a moment that he had let Jesus down, he was broken and there was the pain, the bitter pain of regret in his life. Here's a man who, who had to remove himself to go outside and begin to weep and he wept in a bitter way because of the actions that he had made, because of the words that he had said. He regretted those things because he knew he had chosen worldliness over the righteousness of Christ. He had chosen the world's way rather than standing firm with Jesus. And he was broken. And he began to weep over, over his sin. You know, as I think about regret, I think there are different types of regret. And I've, I've sort of touched on this already. I want to I wanna sort of bring this to the table again because I want us to be sure we understand what we're talking about here. You know, I, I believe that there are some regrets that we have as people that just sort of flow from just foolish decisions that we make that really don't have any sort of eternal consequence to them. You know, there's just things that we... That, that happen in our life and we just find ourselves saying, you know, I wish I hadn't done that. Doesn't necessarily mean that we're turning away from Jesus or anything. They're just bad decisions. I remember years ago when I was 11 years old, there was this man that was a motorcycle stunt rider and his name was Evil Knievel. If you're old enough to remember him, you know who I'm talking about. Some of you are like, I'm Googling him now, Right? Because you've never heard of this guy. It's E-V-E-L, not E-V-I-L, just in case you're looking. But Evil Knievel was this guy who was a, he was a little bit crazy. He, he would jump uh, from one ramp to another, and he would, he would see just how far he could jump on a motorcycle, and he would put these cars out, and, and, and I mean, he would jump, you know, 20 cars, then 25 cars, then 30 cars. Then he went to school buses because he was going so far, and he broke a lot of bones along the way. But for every 11-year-old boy during those days, we just really admired this guy who had this ability to jump so far on a motorcycle. So what do you think we did as 11-year-old kids with bicycles? We couldn't wait to build that ramp. And we would put whatever we could in front of that ramp so that we could see how much we could jump over. We would jump over trash cans. We would get our little sisters and stack them up so that we could jump. I mean, whatever it took, we would, we would just put stuff there. And as we jump, we would get further and further. And just like this, this, this crazy motorcycle rider, we were doing the same sorts of things as kids until one day we built this huge ramp. And I think we even had one of the dads that came out and he helped us build it. And we stacked up every neighborhood trash can that we could gather up. I mean, it was a long ways. And I, and I love it how your friends, you know, they always do this kind of thing. David, you go first, right? And so I was just bold enough, just maybe dumb enough to, to go first. And so I remember getting at the top of the hill and it was a long way down to that driveway. And, uh, and I remember, man, as I took off, just getting all the speed I could get. And as I'm headed down, I'm centered on that ramp. I know I gotta hit that ramp. And I mean, I've done this 100 times. I, I know I can do it. It's gonna be okay. And I hit that ramp, and I get more air than I've ever thought about getting in my life. I mean, I am just flying through the air. And as I reach just unimaginable heights on a bicycle, passing all those trash cans, suddenly the front tire just falls off the bicycle. <laughs> and it's in that moment that I regretted my decision. <laughs> now, I don't think my salvation was dependent on that stupid mistake, right? That, that dumb decision that I just made. 
It was just a careless thing to do. As I'm flying through the air, I'm, I'm literally imagining how can I land this thing on a wheelie, right? Because that's my only hope for survival. I'm wondering if my parents are gonna still love me when they have to bury me. You know, all these, these thoughts just go through your mind and you, you wonder how is this gonna end? And, and I'll tell you, it didn't end that well. I, I didn't break any bones. I knocked the dust off my body and got up. And of course, everybody thought it was just amazing that they just witnessed this. But, but anyway, that was just a, a dumb decision, right? But there's other regrets that we have in life that we can't go back on. The regrets that we have when we pursue things other than Jesus. And it's in those things that we just seem to carry with us forever. And we find to be the most hardest to get over, to push through. I'll give you an example. Adam and Eve, they had it so good. As God created Adam and Eve, we read in the, the, the account in Genesis where they, they really had this perfect fellowship with God. And then one day, you know the story, they ate the fruit that was forbidden by God. They disobeyed God and sin entered into the world. And suddenly this, pers- uh, this perfect fellowship with God was no longer And instantly in that moment, when we see this disobedience toward God, we see shame enter the picture. We see regret enter the picture. These are the kind of decisions that we make that do have eternal consequences. We read in Genesis 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, But the Lord called to the man and he said to him, Where are you? And he said, I've heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So often it's these kinds of regrets that lead us into hiding, hiding from God, not wanting to face our Savior because we know that we've disappointed him. This is where Peter found himself. This is where Peter is is wondering if life is gonna be any better from this point on. This is the kind of regret that brought about deep sorrow and pain in Peter's life. And it's the kind of regret that he almost loses hope in everything. But you see, here's what's really amazing. That when a follower of Christ Jesus is willing to confess of his sin and repent of his sin and turn away from his sin, God does something really wonderful in a person's life. You see, what we begin to realize as we read through the scriptures that repentance, it removes that tension between ourselves and God. Repentance, it removes that tension and it restores the hope and the joy that we have in Christ Jesus. When we turn to God in desperation, maybe because of the past that we have, because of the the regrets that we live with, when we turn to God and we cry out to him, God is faithful to restore our relationship with him. How many of you are thankful for that, that God is forever faithful in our life? David said in Psalm 51, he says, cast me not away from your presence and, not, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. He says in verse 12, he says, restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. You know how many times I've prayed that very prayer myself, as I find myself living in a place of regret. But every single time I cried out to God and I said, God, I wanna follow you. He was faithful to forgive. He was faithful to show his mercy. He was faithful to bestow his grace upon my life, just like the testimony that we saw earlier. God is always faithful. And where David cried out to God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He reveals to us that when we turn to God, it doesn't mean that we can just start living a life where we don't not just pull the chain of regret with us, but rather we can also have the joy that we once had when we found Christ to begin with. And that's what's so beautiful. He makes us all new again. It's beautiful 
to see who Jesus is and to know that Jesus is still in the business of restoring lives. There's gonna be regret in your life, amen. Give him praise. There's gonna be regret in your life. There's gonna be sorrow in your life. There's gonna be pain in your life. But we don't run and hide. We turn and run into the arms of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask our band to come on out. As we look at this, I realize that Peter must have momentarily experienced this shame and regret over this public denial of Christ, but really his deepened understanding of Christ overcame any feelings he might have had of failure. And that's beautiful to me. So how do we apply this to our life? As we look at the story where Peter experienced sadness and, and shame, as we look at the story where Peter went through this horrifying moment when he realized the sin in his life and he realized that he had grossly let Jesus down. As we look at this story, we begin to understand some really remarkable things that by remembering that Christ is who our identity lies in, shame and regret is something that we can put behind us. Shame and regret is something that we can put behind us when our identity is in Christ Jesus. Two last verses and then I'm done. Romans 6, 4 says this. It says, we were buried therefore with him in baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Isn't it beautiful that what Jesus offers to us is the newness of life. Darren, I could almost imagine what you were going through a while ago, brother. As I had the opportunity to baptize both of my daughters. What an emotional time that is for us to look down and see our daughters knowing that they trust in Jesus Christ and they believe in Jesus Christ and they know Jesus Christ and they wanna follow through with believers' baptism proclaiming that publicly to the church. I know why you get all choked up, brother. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I didn't hear what you said, but... Yeah. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's not embarrassing to me. It's, I was crying like a baby in here. But the newness of life, that's what Jesus offers to us. That's what we celebrate and baptism. That was the point of why I brought it up. I knew there was a reason. I was sitting here looking at you wondering why I'm even talking about this, but, but when we're baptized, we celebrate the newness of life. But the last thing I wanna leave you is Romans 8, 1. And it says this, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. My friends, I just wanna say this to you this morning. If there's anything in your past that needs to be put behind you, Jesus is here for you. If there's anything in your past that needs to be put behind you, then Jesus is here for you. In just a moment, our band's gonna come out. We're gonna celebrate Jesus in that last song and and during this time, if there's, if there's any reason why you may just want to spend some time with the Lord, our altar is open, our pastor's down front, we'd love to pray with you, we'd love to walk with you through whatever it is that you've been hanging on for so long. But can I say this, there's no reason to hang on any longer. Jesus cares deeply for you. He loves you more than you could ever love him. And he is waiting for you.